This is why we thought the Jets were going to be good in the first place. All right, it's the Brewer Report for November the 1st. Week 9 is here. We're at the midpoint of the 2024 NFL season. Again, November is here. And Week 9 got off to an interesting start. Didn't start with a bang, but an interesting start with a Thursday night game. The New York Jets snap a five-game losing streak. Jeff, Jeff Albrecht gets his first win as the team's interim coach. And maybe there's a little something to build on here for the Jets. Now, I think to really fully assess where they're at, you got to look at where they were coming into the game. And it was a tense week in that building. Um, over the last couple of days, a lot of people felt like they were walking around on eggshells. That was a bad loss on Sunday to the New England Patriots. Um, for obvious reasons, people feel like their jobs are on the line. There have been I, like there's just buzz around the NFL about there being seismic change in New York um, coming after the season. So a lot for the people there to compartmentalize. And then the first half was really ugly. Uh, there was the Malachi Corley uh, touchdown, non-touchdown. Let's go of the ball as he's crossing the goal line. Aaron Rodgers didn't play very well in the first half, admittedly. Um, and it really felt like this season for the Jets, this season that they put so much into and that they'd invested so much in really was on the brink. And there was a ton on the lines. They came out of the locker room down seven to nothing against the Houston, Texas team. That's pretty damn good. And I think over the last 30 minutes of that game, we saw the reasons why people were so excited about the Jets to start the year. And they're able to go out and, and outscore the, the Texans. I believe it was 21 to six over the final 30 minutes of that game and do it in a way that really highlighted the sorts of players that they have. And in a, number, in a number of different ways, Aaron Rodgers played better. I'd say probably not his best football of the year. That was probably the first Thursday night game they played, how well he played against New England. But some of the best football that he's played all year there in the second half. Um, and, you know, a couple of playmakers just making massive, massive plays. Um, first, it was it was Garrett Wilson on that third and 19. Uh, third and forever looked like the Jets were going to be resigned to kicking a field goal there. Garrett Wilson makes just a Spider-Man catch. Um, and remember, the, the the rapport between Wilson and, and Rodgers wasn't there earlier in the year. It's part of the reason why they trade for Devontae Adams. But for Wilson to go up and make that catch um, shows why he was regarded as one of the best young receivers in football coming into the season. You know, and then Devontae Adams making a play, um, you know, after that, where, again, it looked like the Jets were positioning to go and kick a field goal. And Devontae Adams just absolutely toasts a really good rookie in Lasseter, a guy who's played really well for the Texans, um, to score the touchdown, to give them the separation that they wound up needing in the end um, to take home the win. And then on the other side of the ball, you'd be remiss if you didn't mention the defensive line and the job that the guys up front did and Quinn and Williams' dominance and um, Hassan Reddick coming in and, and making a difference and, and Clemens, you know, like making a big play. His sack of C.J. Stroud was huge there in the second half. Eight sacks from the defensive line. So this is why we thought the Jets were going to be good in the first place, because they had Aaron Rodgers throwing to maybe the best group of receivers that he's played with, right, in, in Devontae Adams and Garrett Wilson and Mike Williams. Like, that's why there was so much promise a few weeks ago when they traded for Adams and because of the defensive line um, and, and, and the group that they had up front, they came into the year. And I know Jermaine Johnson's down now, but they came into the year with eight former first round picks in that defensive line group. And we certainly saw the talent there and the way they were able to dominate the Texans up front and really get CJ Stroud off of his game. So there's something to build on there. Now they're three and six. The schedule is not as tough um, from here on out. Um, you know, we'll see. I think that, you know, what, 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 what the real litmus test now will come and, and how they come out of this and whether or not they're able to build off of it. And, um, you know, they've got, you know, some nice runway now and coming off the mini buy, uh, but they are going to Arizona next. So it's another cross country trip against a really, really competitive Arizona team that's playing great ball right now. That's in first place in the NFC West, albeit in a tie. Um, I think this is going to be a tremendous test for the Jets. And they do get some rest now, which is great because this is a team that's played two Monday night games, that's played two Thursday night games, that traveled to London, that really got screwed by the schedule makers. Um, you know, now they come out of this and they have a chance now to build some momentum. We'll see what happens. But a great way to come out of a tense week and come out of a really bad start to the game on, on Thursday night um, to be able to 
<clears throat> you know, put their foot in the ground and turn things around the way that they did, I thought was really, really impressive. All right, our second topic for today, the trade deadline, still a few days away. You're going to hear some of the names out there, and we've been through them. Um, you know, there's a receiver market out there. New England's received some calls on receivers like K.J. Osborne. Carolina already moved Deontay Johnson. Adam Thielen's name has been out there. Um, the, the Titans, who already moved DeAndre Hopkins, could wind up moving Traylon Burks. Um, the pass rush market, you know, there, there are players out there as well. Preston Smith and Green Bay, Zadarius Smith in Cleveland, Jadevian Clowney in Carolina. You know, and then some other names, Greg Newsom. Um, you know, corner in Cleveland, like he's been the subject of, of trade talks as well. So you have some names out there. One name that did move this week was Deontay Johnson's, and that's the one I want to focus on here. Now, Johnson goes to Baltimore with a sixth round pick, with a fifth round pick coming back. So that's not much. Um, so part of the thing with Deontay Johnson, I think this is the advantage a team like the Ravens have is that he has been a problem in the past. And everybody saw what happened at the end of Pittsburgh and the reason why he was traded from the Steelers in the first place. It wasn't that he couldn't play. It was that they had gotten fed up with him. And so there are teams out there that need receivers that probably couldn't absorb a Deontay Johnson based on where their programs are. The Ravens aren't that team. The Ravens have a very strong locker room, a very strong program. Uh, John Harbaugh has been there now. Um, for 17 years, um, they can take risks on players like this. And this is a guy who can really add to what they've already got. And it's a good group on offense. You know, you add you add Deontay Johnson to a receiver room where you've already got Zay Flowers and Rashad Bateman. You've got Isaiah Likely, a tight end. Um, the, the offensive line has started to come together. Um, and that was something that they were, they really counted on their ability to draft and develop. They've had four players really play the three spots that were vacated in the off season. They turned over 60% of their offensive line from what was in the AFC title game with guys like Roger Rosengarten and Andrew Voorhees and Daniel Falele and Pat McCarry be the veteran of that group. So, you know, you see the way the offense has kind of coalesced and come together. Lamar Jackson is playing at an MVP level again. Um, so to get Deontay Johnson and be able to plug him back in there, um, you know, I think gives them a little bit of a boost, um, gives them another weapon out there. And it's a chance for them to take advantage of the fact that there wasn't a great market for Deontay Johnson because of some of the stuff that happened in Pittsburgh um, and because not every team can, can, can absorb the sorts of problems that he might, that he, that he might present. And so, um, you know, it's just an interesting move by the Ravens to, 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 to go in and, and, and go all in on, on the team that they have right now. Certainly, um, you know, before, you know, they lost, uh, they lost in Cleveland, um, you know, five game winning streak. And over the course of those five games looked like they might be the best team in the NFL with all due respect to the lions. Um, so, you know, like this is again, like kind of a signal to the locker room that we're all in for this group right now. I think it's a good group. I know John Harbaugh really likes the group he has. Um, and you know, really some of the moves that they've made have been able, have, have been, have been in, entrusting what they already have on the inside and, in, changing out the offensive line in going with Trenton Simpson at linebacker over after, after losing Patrick queen in replacing Mike McDonald as defensive coordinator with Zach or um, so this is bringing in somebody the out, from the outside to affirm what they've already done on the inside. I wouldn't be shocked if they have another move in them. I wouldn't be stunned if they look at maybe the defensive back market and see if there's something out there for them. Finally, um, our third topic and, this will go right back to the topic that everybody likes to talk about constantly, and that's the state of the Dallas Cowboys. They're three and four. Uh, they've fallen behind in the NFC East race. Um, obviously, a lot of noise surrounding the Cowboys over the last couple of weeks. They've lost two in a row, and now they're coming off their bye, and they play against a really hot Falcons team. And, you know, I think what's interesting about this matchup is how much there is going to be on Dak Prescott to go out and be the $60 million man and go out and win them a ball game that they really need to win. Obviously, Demarcus Lawrence, you won't see him out there this week. Micah Parsons hasn't practiced this week. Chances are he's probably going to need another week. Um, the defense has been messy as is, even when those guys were in there. Um, and they're playing against a really good offense. And Atlanta offense that's really started to come together around Kirk Cousins. So this really falls on the shoulders of the $60 million man. And what are they going to be able to get out of Dak Prescott? And can he carry the team 
in a really important spot. I'm fascinated to see what happens with the Cowboys here. And that's one of the marquee matchups of week nine, no question. The Falcons have a chance to really stamp themselves as a contender in the NFC. With their win over the Bucs last week, they were able to take control of the NFC South. And this would be another step for Raheem Morris' program. Playing as a team that's been a playoff team in the last three years, that's always been a contender in the NFC, being able to, to, to come out of that one with a win, this is a big game for the Falcons too. Again, a real test for where the Cowboys are in 2024. Appreciate you guys coming out. We'll be back at you with another Breer Report next week, coming out of week nine. At that point, we will be exactly halfway through the NFL season. Um, we will see you guys then.